What we're going to do today is to go over uh, just some basic information about uh, Fulbright in the classroom, what our original ideas were, uh, and look at some of the uh, reporting that we have received from four of the chapters that undertook uh, projects of various duration during the course of the last year. At the end of the uh, presentation, we will then uh, open it up to questions. I did want to just note that uh, one of the uh, chapters that was involved, the Iowa chapter, uh, is represented here today. And so uh, you'll be able to hear directly from one of the people, at least, who was involved. And we think that there may be others who can also answer questions. And because they have actually done a pilot of this program, uh, they're probably much better uh, suited to uh, answer your questions than I am. But for now, let's get started with the PowerPoint. Uh, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, you'll be able to go back and look at it because we are recording today's um, uh, event. So let's just begin by looking at uh, the concept of what Fulbright uh, in the classroom is going to look like. We began by the, taking the premise that high school graduates are unprepared for the globalized world. In a, a survey by the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Geographic Society, of 75 questions, the average student was able to get only 55% of them correct. They answered 31% incorrectly and 13% didn't know. Uh, that's just an indication that we can do a better job in our country of preparing our uh, high school graduates and uh, therefore our college students as well for the um, world that lies ahead of them. Uh, we believe that Fulbright alumni are ideally prepared to share their expertise and that K-12 education is ripe for sharing Fulbright experiences and understanding. Four chapters piloted the concept in 2017-2018, Central Virginia, Iowa, Northern California, and Greater Los Angeles. Some of the initial ideas that we had when we first got started with Fulbright in the classroom that we should focus on American Fulbrighters and their experiences that we should prepare the Fulbrighters for the K-12 classroom in case they were not uh, used to dealing with uh, K-12 students, that we wanted to integrate the curriculum with the needs of the classroom teacher, and it was our thinking at the time that multiple interactions with students would have the greatest impact. We uh, believe that it was important to uh, develop a curriculum in advance, uh, that we work with co-sponsors such as Sister Cities International, the National Council for the Social Studies, and the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, all three of which we have formal partnerships with, as well as the World Affairs Councils and UNA USA and other uh, curricular organizations. Uh, the thinking was that in the event that uh, our local chapters did not have uh, direct contact with uh, school systems, that they would be able to take advantage of some of the contacts from these other organizations, which uh, may have those contacts so that we could get our entree into the uh, various uh, schools and school districts. Now let's take a look at the reality of how things worked out. We'll begin with Central Virginia. They were the first chapter uh, to uh, actually propose a Fulbright in the Classroom project. Um, and they began with a lot of enthusiasm, as I'm sure a lot of you on this call today uh, have. Um, they focused on a school district with a rural and uh, homogeneous student body. They wanted to pair international Fulbright students with an American Fulbright alumnus, uh, but they got mixed signals from the school district that they were trying to get into and it resulted in an inability to uh, implement the proposal that they had in mind. They came up with a couple of uh, recommendations. The first was that you should find a Fulbright alum who is actively working with or is in currently employed by the selected school system where you want to work 
or alternately, that you should select a school system in which known Fulbright alumni relationships exist to facilitate the communication and contacts. Iowa is the uh, best uh, example of where the project worked, and we have on uh, the line with us today Ann Russell, uh, so she'll be able to also answer any questions that you may have about the uh, uh, Fulbright in the classroom as it was uh, implemented in Iowa. They de decided to focus on international students, and they uh, involved three Fulbright Association members five Fulbright uh, students, uh, international students, 200 middle school uh, students who uh, were uh, able to, to learn from these Fulbright uh, students that were uh, in uh, Iowa, and it involved eight members of the middle school staff. I'm going to try to just to uh, play a videotape. Uh, some of you may have already seen it, but uh, I think it's worth showing because it uh, demonstrates the stuff that you really can succeed, uh, that you can achieve if you're uh, able to uh, get into the classroom. Let's just see if it works. From this year, okay. several international students and scholars at Iowa State have taken breaks from their studies to teach Iowa middle school students about their different backgrounds and cultures. Do you find learning English easy or difficult? It's all part of the Fulbright program, which is a scholarship program designed to exchange scholars between the United States and countries all over the world. The idea is that they're citizen ambassadors. They're scholars, they're studying a certain area, but they're also um, wanting to have a cultural exchange. This is the first year that this cultural exchange has extended to Iowa middle schools, and Iowa State has partnered with Van Meter to lead the way. So we're one of three states who, to first start doing it, and this is our first school that we're doing it in. Those students are, are interested in learning, that they're engaged in the conversation, they want to learn about other cultures. Jen Sigrist, Director of Personalized Learning and Innovation, And Iowa State has partnered with Van Meter to lead the way. So we're one of three states who, to first start doing it, and this is our first school that we're doing it in. Those students are, are interested in learning, that they're engaged in the conversation, they want to learn about other cultures. Jen Sigrist, Director of Personalized Learning and Innovation for Van Meter Schools, says she jumped at the chance to involve her school in this cultural outreach. Racially, ethnically, our school is not very diverse. So getting this opportunity is really something for them to um, to kind of branch out and think about how are other people's perspectives. That's a great opportunity for me to talk to young kids about um, uh, like cultures, what I have back home. Alfred Okono is a PhD student in the genetics program at Iowa State. He came to Iowa six years ago in a Fulbright scholarship from Indonesia. He says teaching young students about his culture has been a great experience. They're really engaged and they got like really interested about uh, my countries. They ask like a lot, a lot of questions. I'm glad that um, they were able to see something different. And for the Van Meter students, it's been a great opportunity to learn more about parts of the world that they haven't experienced before. Not everyone thinks exactly the same way you do. They don't have the same set of experiences and they don't have the same set of beliefs and traditions, and that's an ongoing, lifelong um, lesson to be learned, um, but I hope this was at least a step. Next semester, this program will continue its outreach into Iowa schools, this time in Oskaloosa. For Iowa State News Service, I'm Dave Olson. We have a really big... To continue on with some of the uh, uh, experiences that uh, Iowa State, that Iowa had this year, they decided to focus on global citizenship. They had one board member who worked with the school district and one board member who worked with the International Fulbright students. Uh, three to four students were taken on each of two visits to the school. Um, and in retrospect, they believe that one visit uh, probably would have been sufficient. And all middle school uh, students met in an assembly before breaking into groups with the visiting Fulbrighters. And you see in the picture here, uh, one of the uh, Fulbright students 
uh, addressing the, uh, the middle school students. Northern California was another place where they worked on uh, the Fulbright in the Classroom project last year. They indicate that voluntary recruitment uh, proved to be a little bit slower than they had anticipated, so they had only one uh, presenter uh, uh, during the course of the, of the year. The curriculum focused on global citizenship using elements of a Fulbrighter's experience and hands-on activity related to the Fulbrighter's host country. Uh, just, uh, just to point to the difference between the two models, uh, Northern California was uh, using the American Fulbrighter experience, whereas Iowa was focusing more on the international students' uh, experience. Uh, they, in Northern California, the uh, Fulbrighters completed a brief training program that discussed lesson structure, modeling a sample lesson, and best practices for the classroom. And Fulbrighters were also put in touch with their host teacher in school prior to the lesson to encourage collaboration and alignment with the host teacher's uh, curriculum. And today, uh, Meg Ramey is on the line with us uh, from Northern California. And so at the end, she'll also be able to answer any questions you may have. Uh, continuing on with Northern California, some of the lessons learned were that uh, schools uh, need to ensure that they need to ensure that the schools are on board for the next academic year, that they need to have a continuous recruitment program in order to get more Fulbright alumni involved, and they want to think about the option of offering virtual training instead of having all uh, teachers who are involved coming in, all of the Fulbrighters involved coming in for the actual training. Uh, the Greater Los Angeles chapter um, decided that uh, they would uh, go out to various schools around the greater LA area and interview them. I'm just going to present uh, the uh, reaction uh, responses from one of the school districts that they visited. Uh, they were told that the program should begin at the start of a new school, school year. Uh, that there should be an inventory of voluntary, volunteer interests and skills so that they could be matched uh, with the uh, student needs, that uh, they saw this as a, it, this one particular school saw it as a good fit for advanced placement capstone project as well as uh, IB uh, CAS project. Uh, the school uh, representatives thought that creating common core compliant lesson plans was too disruptive of teacher plans and they preferred to treat this program as a complement to pre-existing uh, classroom activities. The volunteers must attend a, uh, a training and orientation session before visiting the campus, and it should include an overview of American schools and processes. And uh, in uh, California and elsewhere, there is a requirement that uh, any volunteer going in to meet with the students be screened in advance and that they undergo fingerprinting uh, in order to do the background check. The recommendations that uh, we have taken from the uh, various uh, reports from the uh, four uh, chapters that undertook the pilots and last year include these that I'll let you just read through them really quick, but uh, there we want to emphasize that there's going to be a different model for different uh, audiences and you're going to have to decide what best suits your needs and your abilities. Uh, we do think that uh, one logical place you could go as you try to uh, find uh, Fulbrighters who would be good uh, teachers in the classrooms is to go to uh, talk to the ETAs and teachers that have returned uh, from overseas. Um, we've got some suggestions here about ways that you can get your entree into the schools, including returning to the schools where uh, you uh, originally went to school, for example, or where your children go to school, um, and so on. And uh, we do want to emphasize that it's probably good to start small to get your feet wet, uh, as you uh, then can expand on to uh, bigger and better. Um, we uh, recommend that you follow appropriate rules, such as the background checks, but that you avoid unnecessary uh, bureaucracy and politics. Um, in the case of, uh, let us say, Central Virginia, for example, they managed to get the mayor and city council, uh, city manager 
uh, involved in their project in the school district where they wanted to work, but it may not have been such a good idea. And so you may need to think about where, whether you really want to involve people at that level. And you may not want to go to the principals directly. You may want to uh, work uh, with the teachers within the school who can advocate for the program. And uh, while it still seems like a good idea to talk about uh, ways that you can uh, you know, help out the teacher uh, that you're going to be working with in the curriculum, sometimes one-offs are going to be just as good. And so do think about uh, that. And then although for this last year, we really did emphasize that the uh, Fulbright in the Classroom should uh, be chapter based. You know, there are a lot of places in the United States where chapters may not be as active or w which may be far away. So take advantage of the enthusiasm you have throughout uh, your area. You may not need necessarily to uh, go where the uh, chapter is based. Um, with regard to what we expect for 2018, 2019, we are continuing on uh, with the uh, project. Uh, chapters are free to explore a variety of models. We stand ready to help in any way we can. We do ask that you keep us informed about your plans so that we can share them with others. This is only the first webinar. Uh, we hope you'll share it with others, but also let us know what other topics you'd like us to uh, cover, and we'll try to find people who can help us out as we uh, move ahead. In addition, uh, let us know what you would like. Uh, would a, a listserv uh, be a good idea so that you can share your experiences and problems and questions? Do you want a Facebook group where uh, you can uh, raise issues with one another and learn from others? And then I really do want to emphasize that uh, you have to document every step of the way. It's really going to help you, but it's also going to help others. So take photos of your meetings, your training sessions, your presentations, send them to us so that we can share them and use them for future uh, opportunities that we may have for fundraising. Um, and while a small Fulbright in the Classroom has been a highlight of this year's annual report of the Fulbright Association. Our board is enthusiastic about your work. The State Department supports the program, and there is potential for uh, foundation funding for the future efforts, so uh, your reporting and documentation is essential. Uh, and then some final thoughts. Uh, just to remind you that chapter grants uh, applications are due September 14th. Um, you, uh, this particular program fits under the category of U.S. Alumni Engagement and, and Program Promotion, and there's a, a subcategory called Focus on Community Engagement. This is ideal for that, so do uh, think about Fulbright in the Classroom as you are preparing your, uh, uh, ap your grant uh, application. Uh, and remember that expenses connected to the Fulbright in the Classroom can be included, including mileage, meals, fingerprinting, and things like that. I have my contact information there. I'm happy to try to help in any way I can. And if you haven't yet had a chance to read our evaluation report for the first year, uh, please um, uh, do take a look at it. It has uh, the uh, reports of the four chapters that were involved in 2017-2018 and uh, includes the original concept for the whole uh, paper of the whole project. So now we're going to open it up to questions. Um, we're going to uh, try to uh, respond in any way we can. And as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, representatives from uh, some of the chapters that were involved, and so they may be better able to answer the questions than I can. So we um, are going to invite, this is Kelsey Poholsky, um, Ann Russell and um, Meg Ramsey, um, they're on the call. So if they have um, anything that they can address as we're going through questions, we're going to review um, any questions that come in through the chat function. Um, Ann or Meg, are you, do you have anything you would like to add? Hi, Michael. Um, I'm happy to add something. Anne, did you want to take the lead? No, go ahead. That's... Sure. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is Meg, and um, I am one of the co-founders of 
uh, the Fulbright in the Classroom in the Northern California area. And um, I can just add a couple things to what Michael already shared about what we did this year, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so, you know, I think that it's it's definitely true that um, the different areas have, um, you know, different approaches and have utilized different types of um, Fulbrighters uh, to be the facilitators or teachers in these lessons, um, and then have also used different kinds of curriculum. Um, just to highlight uh, how we did our curriculum, um, what we did is we mostly focused on American Fulbrighters, um, alumni of the Fulbright program, and we developed a curriculum that lasts one uh, school period, so about 45 minutes to an hour. And that curriculum includes a hook, which is a sort of a short activity to get students engaged. It includes a direct teach in which facilitators share a brief presentation about their time abroad, focusing on one theme in particular. And then it includes a hands-on activity in which students actually do a science project or an art project or some other kind of uh, interactive project with their facilitator, which is related to the country and the theme that the facilitator presented. And then finally, at the end of the lesson, the facilitator leads a brief discussion about global opportunities for young people and provides the young people with um, different resources where they can start getting involved in a global community um, as soon as possible, even if they're only in, in middle school or high school. So that's sort of the way that we did that to begin with this past year. And, you know, we only had one volunteer um, do this kind of lesson in a school, but it went really well. And um, we've been hosting a couple of recruitment events this summer. We had two, we had one happy hour in June and we have another plan for August that we really hope are going to bring in even more volunteers. We have about 12 people interested right now. And that number is growing quickly as we continue to have these in-person events too recruit folks. Um, and I would like to say that we're, um, we really love um, learning about different chapters and how they were utilizing international Fulbright students who are visiting here to the US. And so we're definitely going to open up our program uh, and would love to have international students teaching these lessons as well. Yeah. And did you have anything you wanted to share? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I agree with Meg that um, it really it does depend on the local situation a lot. And I think in Iowa, we have rural schools where they, you know, they never see someone of a different religion and, or, you know, ethnicity. And so they're coming from maybe a different place and people in other parts of the country. And so I think we were starting at a much more fundamental level, just getting to, just getting to know somebody one on one. I mean, well, it wasn't exactly one on one, but in a more intimate setting. Um, and especially we we tend to have a lot of students from Pakistan and Indonesia um, in Iowa, uh, Fulbright students. And, um, you know, the timing was such with the with all of the uh, bans on travel and immigration into the U.S. that uh, there really needed to be a dialogue. And so I think the students were feeling the need for it um, to, they really wanted to represent their country in a good light and show Americans that, you know, they have this wonderful culture. And so it was kind of, serendipitous that everything came together at once. And, and we also have a board member who, oh, I don't know her exact title, but she's very high up in the education system. She might be head for the whole state of curriculum or, or something like that, but she's, Erica Cook is very high up um, in that. And, and I'm the student advisor for the Fulbright student organization in Iowa State. So, and then Jen, uh, Erica knows teachers, of course, because she's kind of worked her way up through the ranks. And so she knew the perfect fit for this. And um, it, that that's really what made it easy was that we just, uh, Erica could work directly with the teacher and was thrilled. Uh, you know, she took, took it and ran with it. You know, she, the students just did the one-on-one, -on -one, well, not one-on-one, -on -one, but address small groups of students and, you know, got to an answer any silly question they might have. Like, I mean, we're at the level in Iowa where students had really never seen 
a woman in a hijab and and they wanted to know you know how <laughs> they could ask questions like what's it for and how do you put it on and uh you know just making it a more human experience and um and to me that's really kind of what fulbright was it was all about just getting down to the idea that we're all people and um sharing our culture and so and then the teacher i think took took the ball and ran with it as far as integrating that into the curriculum. I know the students studied a lot about Pakistan and Indonesia, and then South Korea was our other student. Um, so the teacher really took care of the curriculum part. And and like I say, that model, it it's really good for Iowa because in rural areas, because these students just don't get the chance to see people from other countries. Yeah, I, I would chime. I would chime in there just following up on what Ann said. Um, it's interesting the contrast between doing this program in rural and urban areas. Um, so in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is obviously an urban area, um, we have a, a pretty different population of students. The students in the schools that we've been serving um, are very diverse and many of them are uh, the sons and daughters of immigrants. Um, it's primarily low income students of color that we've been working with here. And so um, for these students, it was a sort of a different experience, which was um, that most of these students had never um, spent a lot of time abroad, or if they had, they had mostly spent time um, visiting family um, in a country that they had a personal connection to. And so I think that bringing in uh, Fulbright alumni from who had traveled to all different places in the world and sort of opening up students' eyes to this idea that there are a lot of opportunities out there to travel and explore new places. Um, I think that that was really powerful um, for the students that we were working with. Well, thank yeah. you both. Um, that's, I think, a uh, help to all of us. Kelsey's now going to try to uh, ask some of the questions that we got by chat. If there are others, please send them in. Hi, everyone. Um, so the first question um, someone asked, is it possible to pair a Fulbright Distinguished Award in Teaching recipient to speak with staff while the Fulbrighter speaks with students? Uh, I think any model is, is possible, and we certainly want to uh, advocate for a, a variety of ways of going about it. If, um, if you're able to uh, arrange for meetings at a school with all of the staff while uh, a, a Fulbright student or Fulbright scholar uh, meets uh, with students at the school, that's fine. That would be a, a great opportunity. A lot's going to depend on what you're able to accomplish in terms of your relationship with the school where you decide to um, uh, focus your efforts. Thank you. And our next question, um, someone asked, how often would they participate in this initiative? Is it uh, daily, weekly? I think we addressed this in the PowerPoint, but if you could just remind everyone how often these visits would be. Yeah. Um, when we first got started, we thought that a, a recurring relationship might be a good idea. That, for example, if a, a Fulbrighter came into a classroom, met uh, with the students a couple of times in a semester and perhaps helped them with a, a project at the, that was due at the end of the semester or the end of the school year, that that might be a model. But as we look at some of the lessons learned, it seems like uh, you know an, an, a totally different model might also work. And that is where it's just a, a one-time a meeting with uh, either the American Fulbrighter or with the International uh, Fulbrighter. In other words, you're, you're going to have to decide what you think is going to be best for your community and, and what you can accomplish. Thank you. Um, we also received a question um, regarding curricular content. Could you talk about sort of into interactive strategies or related topics and sort of what the content would be in, in a presentation? Yeah, this is another example where you're going to have to decide what it is that you want to accomplish. And your best bet is to work directly with the classroom teacher. We don't want to disrupt what the classroom teacher is trying to accomplish. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's going to be a matter of deciding whether or not you want to uh, try to integrate into what's already on in the curriculum, curriculum for that class, or if you're going to want to do something totally different. I do believe that 
uh, some Fulbright uh, academics at least uh, may not be used to classroom management techniques for the K-12 classroom. And so it's going to be important to talk about how do you keep a, a, you know, a lesson plan moving on. I taught social studies at a middle school and I know that uh, you know, if you're going to try to uh, maintain the attention of the students, you're going to have to uh, be prepared to move on to a different activity every 10 or 15 minutes just to keep things moving. I, I wonder if uh, either of the um, people who uh, had uh, projects this year wanted to add anything to uh, that, that answer about what it is that you're going to do with regard to a, a curriculum. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Anne's region and my region took different approaches to this. I know that um, that the Iowa region um, was with the international students was really focused on sort of having just like a Q and A format where students could just ask um, Fulbrighters uh, any questions that they had, and that that was in itself just a really interactive and exciting opportunity for both the students and the Fulbrighter. And then on the flip side, we we decided to implement a, a fairly structured curriculum, um, again, that sort of had like a presentation component and then it had this interactive activity component. Um, I would say for the interactive activity, what's really great is to chat with the Fulbright teacher about um, what their passions are and, or what their areas of work or study are. So for example, the Fulbrighter that presented in our region, Julie, um, she is a scientific researcher. And so what she did is she brought in a science experiment for the students to do, which was similar to the research that she had been doing on her Fulbright. And that was a really cool way to tie that in. But I also think art projects, sometimes bringing in food from other countries. Um, there are a lot of really cool ways to bring uh, these global experiences into a classroom in a really engaging way for kids. When we were uh, getting uh, this uh, project off the ground, we met with the executive directors of both the National Council for the Social Studies and the National Council for Geographic Education. And in both cases, they suggested that you might want to work with organizations in the community, for example, the, the uh, local chapters of their organizations or with uh, local uh, teachers who uh, are, uh, you know, like, uh, who have national board certification, and uh, ask them what they think that you should do. They're, they usually are quite willing to uh, uh, engage your um, Fulbright uh, colleagues in this uh, effort. And so you might want to uh, just talk to them about what it is that would be best for your region uh, or for your, your state, uh, your, your school. We'll go on to the next question. Yes, um, someone asked, have all the pilots been primarily for high school students? And could chapters consider, or sorry, any pilot consider grades um, be considered like elementary school grades? That is an excellent question. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things that uh, we did stress in initially was that there's, that it's K-12, it's not just uh, 8 to 12 or 9 to 12 that we're talking about. And it is our hope that uh, people at the elementary and middle school levels uh, are included. It's not just going to be uh, at the high school level. In addition, um, uh, the original ideas, that, for example, we met with some people that teach science and math, and they uh, stressed that uh, Fulbright in the classroom uh, need not necessarily focus only on the social studies, that uh, there are many ways that you can uh, go into an English classroom, for example, or into uh, a, a science or math classroom and talk about uh, your experiences when you were, uh, for example, doing uh, your research uh, abroad. So there are uh, lots of opportunities uh, uh, in a variety of ways. Thank you. We also received a question asking, has any um, group previously done Fulbright in the Classroom during International Education Week in November or have they considered pairing it with International Education Week? Well, this was the first year that we did it, and so um, it, it may not have uh, uh, worked out this year, but I'm sure in the future we're going to have the opportunity to take uh, full advantage of International Education Week because it is something that uh, is a natural hook for this sort of an activity. Thank you. Um, 
Someone asked a question about um, collaborating with existing initiatives. Um, there, the example given by Latika was um, the Tallahassee Peace Jam group. Um, would it be okay to link up with existing connections or programs in schools and embed Fulbrighters within these? Or are we interested specifically in a Fulbright branded program? Uh, no, I, I think uh, working with other organizations and other opportunities is cer certainly something that you're going to have to think about at the local level. Um, we do, uh, speaking of branding, we do hope that you'll get uh, uh, you know some uh, opportunity to uh, focus on the fact that these are Fulbrighters, that they uh, did uh, go abroad and, and so on. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to uh, disregard that, but I think that uh, if there are other opportunities where you can bring in an international component, uh, that's certainly something that you ought to think about. Thank you. Um... A question was asked, have we worked with other Department of State sponsored study abroad scholarship alumni, and the example given was the Gilman, um, for a broader experience? So I guess similar to the last question, going beyond just Fulbrighters and using other um, Department of State um, study abroad scholarship alumni. Yes, I, I do think that that's worth uh, exploring. Uh, we certainly don't want to limit uh, things. Uh, in addition to the State Department's uh, Fulbright program, as you know, uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Education had until just this year a uh, its own Fulbright uh, uh, program. So uh, we uh, do want to, um, uh, uh, you know, include other uh, org other organizations, other opportunities as well. And of course, because this is uh, being funded by the Fulbright Association, we want to stress that in your uh, publicity for it. Uh, be sure to mention that it is the Fulbright Association that uh, you know is supporting this and has uh, tried to uh, move this along. Yes. And um, someone asked the question, how much lead time should people allow in arranging a classroom visit? Would they contact teachers in advance maybe three to four months? What's the um, suggested time frame? I think you're, you're better off uh, asking the people who've actually done it. Uh, I wonder if either Meg or, or Anne has an answer to that. Um, let's see. I think we probably started a couple of months ahead of time. I, I, we talked about it. We probably talked about it in the summer, but Eric and I didn't really start working on it until maybe September. And then um, we did it in November. And uh, yeah. I would agree with Anne. So I think um, when planning with schools, um, you know, if you can, it works really well to uh, not just be planning with a single teacher, but also to get um, connected to, you know, like a dean or an administrator at a school who can help you talk about implementing this at the school more broadly. But either way, whether you're just working with a teacher or whether you're working with a principal, I think what works really well is to try to um, catch those folks um, before the summer begins because the summer is a really busy time and a lot of educators take vacation at that time and then check back in um, towards the end of august early september to let them know that you would like to schedule a meeting um, most educators you know as ann said like it's not going to happen right at the beginning of the school year because that's the craziest time for people. But if you just ping them at the beginning of the summer and then again at the end of the summer, oftentimes you can um, get a meeting and really figure things out uh, by October or November. Uh, and then you can even plan for like the remainder of the school year. Meg, how did you guys uh, target the schools? How did you decide what schools you wanted to try to go into? Sure. Uh, so I am, my background is in teaching and also in nonprofit work. So through both being a teacher myself and then also um, working in a nonprofit that worked with a number of schools in the school district, I had a lot of uh, personal and professional connections to school leaders all over the Bay. So I leveraged those connections to um, sit down and chat with folks about this program. And, you know, everyone was really interested in it. Um, educators had different you know, amounts of interest and different like ideas of what, of how much time they'd be able to dedicate to this project. But yeah, so that's sort of how I started working on these partnerships. But I think also as you go along, you know, 
if you just know anyone who's in the education space, anyone who has a school connection, even if that's not you, I would say just reach out to that person, leverage their connection, see if you can sit down with someone, and then it sort of snowballs from there. You know, everyone knows somebody else, everyone knows another teacher or another principal who might be interested. So um, word of mouth also is, is helpful there. Um, and again, I think for recruiting volunteers, it can be really helpful to do these like in-person kind of happy hour events. Um, that also has been a way that like one of our school partnerships um, was actually formed through one of those events. We, we had a, a volunteer come who works at Summit Public Schools and then um, we were connected to that charter school network and then now we're actually in conversations with the CEO of that charter school network about expanding this program to a number of their schools, so. You know, you know it sounds like in both the, it sounds like in both the case of both Iowa and Northern California that it really depended upon your personal contacts that this idea of a cold call into a school and say, how would you, what do you think about having a, a you know, a full ride in the classroom experience? That may not work so well, that you're really gonna need those uh, prior experience, those prior relationships. Well, I would definitely say so. And I think it, just having someone who, you know, understands how to like kind of speak the lingo and who has a little bit of, a cre of credibility as an educator can make teachers and principals feel much more comfortable considering uh, your program for their school. Right, and and the educator, I mean, Erica knew which schools would be the most receptive to it. And, and I have to say our one for the spring in Oskaloosa did not come off and Erica wasn't, Erica and I were not in charge of that one. And I think the person in charge of it didn't have quite the connections that with the school that Erica had and um, and there wasn't someone, they were gonna bring in the Fulbrighters from University of Iowa and they're, they don't have as tight, well, they don't really have a student organization like we do at Iowa State. So yeah, if, if you can work with existing structure that you already have and people that you know, <laughs> it helps a lot. Uh, I, yeah, even if you if you just know one teacher, you know, one person who works in one school in your area, that person can be enough to, um, yeah. you know, get your foot in the door at one school and then it really can can expand from there. Uh, Meg, I just noticed that your colleague Joyce Kim is on the line as well. Joyce, welcome. Hey. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to uh, to add that we may have overlooked uh, so far? Um, no, I don't believe so. I think Meg um, captured it really well. I think a challenge on my end is that for this last year, I was most I was in England um, doing a master's program. So I think for me, it was uh, really challenging to kind of try to support as much as possible, but not really being able to um, just because of the distance. So um, I think that is something um, to take into consideration when you have um, people who are or um, people who are involved in this initiative that are traveling or whatnot. I see. Okay, but let's go on to another question uh, from Kelsey. Yes, so we um, received a question that said, is there an assessment tool being used to measure the program's impact? Yeah, um, in the case of uh, Central Virginia, they had developed a, a pre and post uh, instrument that they were going to use to see if a uh, student understanding of the international situation had uh, changed as a result of this interaction. Unfortunately, because they didn't ever actually get into a classroom, they weren't able to implement it. But I do think uh, just because uh, most of us are educators and we're uh, so accustomed to evaluation, I do think that it is worthwhile thinking about some sort of an evaluation instrument so that you know if you made any difference. Uh, so yeah. I, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, we did receive a question that I'm going to briefly touch on um, from a few people. Um, some people are asking about the chapter grants that are due September 14th. This is an opportunity offered to um, alumni chapters that have been established by the Fulbright Association. Um, if you do have questions about the um, chapter grants, you can feel free to send me an email. Um, my name is Kelsey and my email address is K-E-L-S-E-Y 
at Fulbright.org. Um, this is an opportunity specifically for the Alumni Chapter Network. Um, this would not be an individualized grant opportunity. This is for, sort of on a larger scale. Um, so for those who are asking questions about it, I'd be happy to chat um, offline about the grant opportunity for our chapters. And we also see a question asking um, about any sort of partnership with the Institute um, for, of International Education. Um, again, this is a Fulbright Association program, um, but maybe Michael can speak a little bit more to that. I, I, I doubt that IE has a, a, a program that would work with us, but um, you know, if you know somebody there, uh, you know, go ahead and, and, uh, and see whether or not you can't work out a, a joint program. I, we have uh, no uh, real concern about it, um, but I, I have a, a suspicion that you're not going to uh, uh, get the kind of support that you need for that, but uh, do try. Um, we also had a question asking about would this be a um, during school or after school program? Um, well, it can be both. Um, and if you look at the original concept paper, you'll see that in the case of uh, One to World in New York, which was a model which uh, is worth looking at, and, and I discuss it in length in our original concept paper, um, they do both. They have some that are after school uh, activities and some that are uh, during the school day. So uh, you can look at both. Um, and it, a lot's going to depend on whether or not you're going to be able to get the kind of uh, uh, numbers that you need for it to work after school. If it's a voluntary after school activity, you may get only uh, the really committed, uh, the really engaged student, whereas I have a feeling that most of us would like to be able to reach a broader uh, student body. Oh, we have a question. Is Fulbright in the Classroom featured in the Study Abroad Workshop? I don't know. Um, it uh, could. I mean, uh, if uh, you have uh, people who know about uh, opportunities for study abroad who are going to be part of the presentation, that, that's fine. Uh, but I, I have a feeling that we're talking more about uh, learning, uh, you know, about uh, overseas um, studies uh, here in the United States. Uh, so it may not be quite the same thing. Does that conclude our questions? Um, that's all the questions that we've received so far in the chat. Um, we do have the option that if you'd like to reach out directly to Michael um, with more specific questions or to start a conversation, his email is available on the screen. Um, that's michael.corf at fulbright.org. Um, if anyone is listening in on the phone and would like to obtain his email address, it's available on the Fulbright Association website, um, so you can feel free to connect there. We have a recent blog post that announced the launch of the program for 2018-2019, so that has some valuable resources. And as well, he's linked to the evaluation report on the screen in front of you, um, and so you can feel free to read about the evaluation of the 2017 program. Uh, this uh, webinar uh, was recorded and so it will be available in case you want to share it with colleagues who were not able to join us in person. And as I said at the beginning, if you have ideas about uh, wanting to continue the discussion, the discussion we're available to you. We can uh, have another webinar, but we also can establish either a listserv or a Fulbright, a, a Facebook page. So uh, let us know what you would like uh, and, you know, we're happy to help in any way we can. We, we think this is a great opportunity, and we're so glad that so many of you have participated in today's program. Um, until we meet again, uh, either in person or by webinar, uh, I want to uh, thank you for joining us today, and, and until next time, goodbye.